live here with Stacy Etel. And some of you know Stacy Etel from the Stacy Etel story that you can find at lawofficer.com at stacyetel.com. My name is Travis Yates. I'm the editor in chief of lawofficer.com, Law Officer Magazine. This is going to be an incredible time with us tonight. So we're going to ask you to share this on your Facebook timeline. Uh, you can watch this after it's live. We'll also have this at lawofficer.com, but you will not want to miss. What we have planned for you tonight. Stacy Tell from the state of Florida, thank you for being here with us at Law Officer TV. Glad to be here, Travis. How's Exciting. your time? How's your time being here so far? It's been awesome. Been treated real well and uh, met a lot of nice people. You know, I think many in our audience know your story. Uh, they've read the article, it has been widely distributed, and you know that for a fact. Uh, but you went into law enforcement at a young age. I'd just like you to tell our audience what made you decide to do that. You know, I kind of uh, joined the military. Uh, at a young age, so I kind of enjoyed that military mentality and the paramilitary route that law enforcement right. was. I had lost some parents to a to a drunk driving crash that somebody had caused the death of my parents to, and my wife had gone through some stuff involving some domestic stuff with his, her family, and and they had been killed, and and so I felt like this was an opportunity to make a difference that I, that most jobs don't give you that opportunity to do, and and so I jumped into it. It was kind of a clean slate, and it was a run, and I was twenty. 22, 23 years old at the time, and it was just a way to, to take off and impact some people. So your parents are killed as a teenager. Your your wife's parents are killed as a teenager, all of it from violent acts. You two come together at a very young age, and you decide to go into law enforcement. What did your wife think about that? Yeah, I don't think my wife ever had an issue with it. I think she was very comfortable with it. I think that she she uh, saw it as a, as a very respectable area of right. work, and uh, I think she was pretty impressed with it. Right. So you enter law enforcement. And you end up at the University of Florida as a, a brand-new officer, University of Florida. You start your career. Tell us how your career early on and in, into your career went there. I tell everybody, I, I could not have had a better career. I, I jumped into it at a young age. I uh, immediately jumped in some training background and some bicycle stuff and got really actively involved in bicycle training and started teaching a lot. I uh, got into training at the police academy mm -hmm. and took off with that. And my career accelerated. I made sergeant at a very young age. I think I was 25 when I made sergeant, um, did my time as a sergeant in various divisions and worked in pretty much every division within the agency, investigations, training, patrol, uh, special events and stuff like that. Right. And, and uh, had taught at the police academy for years, kind of became the lead guy in a lot of areas and just took off. My career was just rolling. Got promoted as a lieutenant, went back and got my college degree, thought, well, my next step is ready to roll. And three months later, a big incident occurs. Well, before the big incident, uh, we – We've read Urban Meyer's book, Tim Tebow's book. They actually both mention your name. You had some connections there with some high-profile athletes and coaches because of the trust they had in you from that commander standpoint at the University of Florida. And tell our audience kind of how that motored into, into uh, the, the friendships they ended up being. You know, I, I, early on in my career, I, I had won Officer of the Year, and they gave me a chance to go to the Sugar Bowl for a day or what, for the weekend. To see Florida the game. wins football games? Yes, Florida won a football game. They used to. And, they used uh, to. I went to uh, – I went to the Sugar Bowl, and that would be Florida State. Oh, and, uh, sorry. I went to the Sugar Bowl, <laughs> and, and, um, and, and from there, I kind of got involved and just kind of traveled a little bit as an advanced team and, and did some of those things. And I'd, I'd gotten very involved in running a bunch of events as a supervisor uh, at various facilities there at the college. And so I was really involved in a lot of things and right. got into the mentoring aspect of, of players and, and different sports and was speaking to them about good choices and, and kind of got attached to it. And then uh, when there was a transition period between coaches and Coach Mark came on board, I got, got assigned to him as kind of his personal guy to handle a lot of his personal stuff. Right. And, and I kind of took off with that. They brought in a young player named uh, Tim Tebow who came in and built a relationship with him. And, and my career blossomed. Uh, it just it could not have been any better. It right. really could not have gone any better for my career at that agency at the time. So you're there close to 20 years. Uh, you've got friendships in high places, so to speak. Great. You've been mentoring young kids. You've been teaching, you know, the incoming freshmen. You are highly involved in so many things. Tactically, you're, you're, I know you're a lead uh, bike instructor there in the state of Florida. Tactically, you're really trusted upon for your experience and knowledge. And then one night it all changed. And tell our audience what happened. You know, I was running a, uh, I believe it was a Florida Tennessee basketball game at, at an arena. And, and, uh, I was actually, I was just at that event and, uh, a sergeant, some officers had responded to a disturbance downstairs of a two-story complex involved in a married housing area, and and I listened to it on the radio, and I, I, the sergeant came on the radio and said something about he had just threatened to shoot at him or shoot something or something to that effect, and 
and I realized oh, this might be a kind of a priority call, and so I responded over there. Uh, I called and asked some of our what we call CRT officers. Mm-hmm. Our ready rifled officers basically to respond, and they did from the event. They were on other shifts, but they responded, and and we did what most people do: you go to the scene, you secure the area, you try to make communication with the person, right. you evacuate the immediate area, you take whatever tactical decision you need to take, and and that's what we did. And in our college, we get a lot of people that are in mental mental crisis at the time, and and we kind of followed the procedures you do. Uh, the the individual that was in there was uh, I didn't know it at the time, but he was in his late thirties and. And uh, he worked for an individual that was a professor, and that professor showed up, uh, who was the, the dean of the school, and he spent some time trying to talk mm-hmm. to him. So now you've not, not only have you tried, but you've also brought in somebody he's familiar with. Right. And that was crucial. And he, he came on board. We communicated for a long time. Uh, some of the individuals that were at the front door on the entry area, they, they had listened, and they felt like nobody could really get anywhere with him. And, and we didn't know much about him other than what we had been told by, by that dean. And... At some point, he shut off communication, and when he shut off communication, I got concerned. And in, in, in a college environment, when when family members that go to school there notify parents via Facebook or notify friends via Facebook or other avenues that they're going to hurt themselves or possibly hurt themselves or could hurt themselves, we respond and we'll generally take action to assist them. And and that might be the render aid or it might be to the rescue them from themselves. And in this case, I made a decision that I thought was best, which was to enter that that residence, and I did. And uh, the five of us went in. And we had everything set in place. We had tasers. We had beanbag rounds. We had uh, obviously our own handguns, and we had rifles. And we were prepared for whatever level or what we thought wasn't going to be any of those things. Right. We thought it was going to be a medical response. And so we did. And um, we went in, and uh, the first officer observed the individual hiding on the other side of a fold-up bed in a really small area. The bed was folded out. He saw him, and he engaged him, saw he had a, a knife, was yelling knife, so he shot his taser, and the taser got residual but it didn't give full effect. And it rolled from uh, from initial contact to the subject started to get up, so he shot a second round. He missed. So as he came around the bed, he was armed with a big table leg with a little screw sticking out, and he started coming at the officers and at, at, at the stack of officers. And, and um, the next officer in line was a sergeant. He had four beanbag rounds and a 12-gauge, and he fired the beanbag rounds as an impact weapon. All four rounds struck the individual. I'm watching this happen in front of me. None of the rounds affected him. He felt no response to it. He showed no response. And as he started to swing that that metal rod down, um, the officer that was third in line fired an AR round, two rounds, and struck him in the hand and the face and dropped him at that point. And uh, immediately it turns into a medical response to him, rendering aid, uh, separating the officer and the supervisor out and allowing them to deal with the, the, the shooting aspect of it. And going from there to um, once once medical response occurred, to then dealing with the crime scene and and all of those things right. and 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 you know sequestering witnesses and you know all of those things that you get to of an instant and it flowed really really smooth. So immediately afterwards, you've been in a in a uh, critical incident, high profile incident. You were the commander, not the shooter. You were the commander, and and uh, immediately afterwards, you actually feel pretty good about what occurred not that it was it was tragic what occurred but you feel good about the tactical response and you're getting some people saying good job afterwards you know you look at it from a tactical standpoint in this country and, and we can look at a lot of shootings that have happened but where in this country have we had six less lethal actions before a lethal force occurred sounds like de-escalation to me you as know, much as you can do you, yeah you, you use your verbal you use your your less lethal and you do your best to do it and sometimes it doesn't always function and work the right way and so from a tactical standpoint, I thought it went about as smooth as it could. And nobody wants to be involved in a shooting. Nobody wants to take, take action that results in a shooting of an individual in this country. Right. There's no desire to do that. But right. unfortunately, it occurred. And from there, we did the best we could from a medical standpoint. Um, and, and, and we were getting feedback. You know, you could tell people were like, wow, y'all use that many things. And it was rolling. That night, they did a press release. Right. And, and the interviews were really good, done well by uh, the captain from our agency that did it. And we thought, wow, this thing's going well. I went home and told my wife about it. I said, here's what happened, and it went smooth. And um, who knows what you're going to wake up to the next day. So you wake up the next day, and the story has changed somewhat. What do you, what do you find out the next day? Well, immediately um, we didn't know a lot of things about this individual. We didn't know he had childhood polio. We didn't know that there had been times when he had utilized a cane for support. We don't know that stuff. And also, what I don't think many people know, and whether I'm supposed to say or not, I'll just tell you, he was very mentally ill, and you had no idea. 
yeah, that was the whole point. None of that stuff I knew. I didn't yeah. even know his mental illness status to the extent that it was until after the investigation five months later. Right. I didn't know any of that stuff. What I did know, though, is some of the little things that I started reading about people that were blogging right. about this individual because he had been a teaching assistant. So I'm thinking, oh, and then obviously we knew he was a black male, and then the five of us were white. From another country, correct? That is correct. He was from Africa. He was in his late 30s, and okay. he was working on his doctoral program. So you, you had this dynamic, white officers, black male from Africa, they're working on a doctoral program, highly mentally ill issues. I have a feeling the mental issues got pushed to the back burner as far as that. And obviously the praises you got from people and even, even staff from the university that initial night, it all starts fading away, and you wake up the next day, and you see, I believe, protest are starting to occur? Yeah, what happened was they started putting out that um, – the individual had had a cane in his possession and that we shot him with his cane, which none of us ever saw the cane inside right. the resident. And so that story accelerated. And so once that story started running, you got five white officers, you got a one black male that was shot by him with a rifle, right. and you've got all this negative attention, and it starts taking off. And the protests started occurring. you got a really liberal environment at a college, and it just starts running with it. And that's right. what happened. And so this is 2010. This is long before Ferguson, Missouri. It's long before the protests that we see today. It, it, when you do a Google search on this incident, you see all the photographs, obviously, from the protesters, and it's, it's pretty massive. Right. At what point in your university, uh, at what point in your mind do you think, nobody has my back here? This is going the wrong way. Because, I mean, you had to think, hey, this is tragic. It's bad. I hate that it's going on, but I did everything right. I may be okay. What, well, when I started realizing there were some problems was when the transition from your own law enforcement administration to the university administration, when they take over that investigation, when they start heading it, you lose that law enforcement component in the investigation. You lose right. that aspect. You lose the media relationship from a law enforcement versus a civilian contact. And that's what started happening. I also noticed that um, through conversations with some of my command staff that I started realizing that they – what I called art of self-preservation, I started seeing an art of self-preservation occur. I started seeing a detachment. I see really weak, spineless, coward leaders. Well, you call it a nicer <laughs> word. Yeah, I call it a little nicer word, but yeah. what I did see is I saw people start saying, wait a minute, I have a career, and you have a career. Well, I had that opportunity, too. Right. My young shooter, in this case, my, the young officer that pulled the trigger, he had been um, through some personal stuff outside of his job that had brought negative attention to him a couple of years earlier. And they, the administration at the university, knew this, so there was an opportunity for them to he focus on He was the target. It. Absolutely, he was the target. And as a leader, you don't allow that. If your employees take the right action, you support your employees. And even if they make decisions that aren't always perfect, you stand with your employee. And, 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 that, and that's what I did. I took care of my subordinate. And because your thing. subordinate did everything right. Absolutely. He, he protected he, numerous he did, officers. He did what was presented to him. Yep. And he, he, he reacted to the behavior of this mentally ill individual. Yep. That and he took, uh, he, took, he took the action that was necessary at the right. time to protect the other officers involved. So you stand up and you say, no, he didn't do anything wrong. That's and good. then all of a sudden it turns to you. And tell us what and, that was and like. And I think my specific words were, he doesn't go in that room unless I put him there. Yep. I'm responsible for sending him in. He's never in that position unless I put him there. Those were my words I can remember in the internal investigation. Um, so he goes on for a few months, and the, the state attorney uh, is handed the information from the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, and the state attorney, not only does he release a fact that there's not going to be any charges against us, and there was that from that standpoint there was nothing wrong, right. but he also says that had we not taken the action we hadn't, it's unknown what could have occurred later on. Right. Pretty good statement from him. Right. And, and so that, act, that statement's released. And then the internal affairs investigation takes place. And once that internal starts rolling, that changes the game. Now you're talking about policies, and you're talking about what policy are you in, you're this policy, you're that yeah. policy, and you know how policies are. Uh, you've been doing this long enough, too. You can place people in whatever policies you need to based on the results that you need to get at that time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they have that all-encompassing uh – what do they call it? The all-encompassing one that they can pretty much throw under. Yeah, actions on becoming. Yeah, or becoming. Action on becoming and this yeah. and that. Yeah. So they're out to get you. They, they don't want to take the heat because obviously the university has some issues with this incident. And uh, as far as what they did to even cause this student to even be there to be able to do that. And you you stand up for your employee. Uh, you start feeling the heat. And what type of support were you getting from 
your form your your officers and and what kind of support structure did you have? Well, it was, it, what happened was they took the five of us and they said, okay, you're on a non uh, law enforcement capacity. You're on administrative duties. Uh, they kept three of us, myself, the sergeant, and the young man who pulled the trigger. They kept the three of us uh, on our night shift, right, in our supervisory role, but not allowed to act as a law enforcement officer. And we rode around in a single cab truck, and we weren't allowed to talk about the case. Which is amazing for five months if you think about that. The employees that were involved in it couldn't work overtime, so they were losing money. Uh, they weren't allowed to display anything that said they were the police. They weren't allowed to drive in police cars, right. but they had to go to work. And so we were kind of we were kind of isolated. And I think the relationship with the five of us was good. The problem was, as you all know, is once those things start happening, you be you move to an island, and everybody yeah. else around you doesn't really want to come to your island. Because they're scared. Well, do they associate themselves to you? And there yeah. were some people that And I want to remind themselves. our audience, you're here at Law Officer TV with Stacey Tell, Deputy in Florida, Executive Director of Law Enforcement Ad- Advocacy Network, and we're going to get to that incredible organization in a minute. But you're, you're looking at a man that did nothing wrong, did his job, was praised by his own department immediately after doing his job, and then the politics get involved, the third parties that know nothing about law enforcement get involved. Does that sound familiar to our audience? And all of a sudden, the organization itself says, we've got to get rid of this, what they deem an issue. Absolutely. And, and what I didn't know was at the point they got rid of me was that they had, um, that this individual was their number one mental health concern in that environment. And you had no idea. Didn't know that. Didn't yep. know, because of HIPAA, they can't report that to right. us. That he was heavily medicated by that on college he was um he had been drinking that night because photographs that are on the internet of the crime scene show the cans of alcohol and the liquor all of that stuff is obvious that there was something going on here that i didn't know anything about and you're dealt the cards you get that night and you make decisions based on what you have that night and that night we made those decisions based on what we had and we knew none of the other stuff either which wouldn't have changed the outcome but had the university stepped up and took responsibility for their failures then the negative attention wouldn't have fallen on the officers because the the outside forces the protesters whatever they're they're seeing you're not getting support from the agency so it just fuels them. oh there's no doubt and this built and this built and this built and how did this affect your wife oh man you know i, I can talk about my wife a lot about a lot of things she her intuition is amazing and her ability to pick up very early on that there was a lot of negative uh she knew early on this wasn't going to go good and, and i don't know why her intuition because i didn't I, I felt like my issue my my history and my my strengths we're going to over, over, overcome this. And uh, she didn't. And um, I think what affects her the most, and I look at things going on now in this country, and that is that she was, um, she was, she has no control over the decisions we make as, as their spouse. Yeah. We make our decisions we make. But th- she deals with so much of the repercussions. She reads it. She sees it. She sees five people that she knows, all the five people involved, and she watches them release articles on them, and she watches them do diagrams and she watches them do videos she talks about how bad they are and she hears the race stuff and she hears all this stuff and she has no control over it and that's a horrible feeling for her and it's a helpless feeling for her at that time and you publicly can't defend yourself whatsoever yeah and that's what bothers me about uh, the job in law enforcement is when you're put under an internal affairs investigation we all know this that are probably watching this you cannot talk about the case you can't research the case for yourself really by talking and interviewing other people and you can't talk about it to the media. Well, if you can't talk about it to the media, none of your staff all the way up can talk about it to the media. Other so than they're only they getting one story. That is correct. And that's and, and you got to feed the media. You have to feed them. You have to feed them something or they're going to feed themselves. And and so when you start doing that, you take away that opportunity to, to tell, the, to tell yeah. your story. Man, it shuts down the truth that comes out. So at some point, the agency, University of Florida Police, they get rid of you. Tell us how that happened, what went down, and what was going through your mind. They, uh, I was a, an at-will employee, so I basically could have a, had a contract for no just cause for non-renewal. Once you make a lieutenant there, they can, and at any point they can And we have ties. agencies around this country, some of our audience, that when they make middle ranks, they are now yep. at-will employees, at will. so to speak. So that's what you I, were I at. just went to Missouri and fought a battle for some lieutenants up there for the same thing. And you're an at-will employee, so at any time they can non-renew you. So listen to what they did. The individual who was involved in the shooting that we shot, he he pled he he pled to the case and was given various parameters. So I want to I want to make sure our audience is aware. You you do everything right. They don't file charges, no grand jury indictment. 
uh, the policies that they're investigating you on to have nothing to do with the shooting. It's the post-shooting notification, whatever they said yeah. it was. What weapon so you have. So the actual event, there's nothing out of policy, and they go – to not renew your contract. Yeah, and they, 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 he was charged. He pled to his he case. He pled to it. Um, they, they, they have an opportunity to, to sacrifice somebody. And it wasn't that they non-renewed my contract. They called me to an off-site location to an attorney's office. They non-renewed my contract. So now, and they pay me six months severance on my separation. So it wasn't like they fired me because they couldn't fire me. But they told the media that they had fired you. Well, not only that, they they might have released that they not renewed me, but the media quoted it as Stacey Attell was fired. Right. Then, not only that, but they released photographs of me. They showed me connected to athletics. I had been speaking and teaching for years in that community, so everybody knew who I was, and they released all that information. And now what do you got? Now you got a firestorm on the Internet of yourself yeah. that you can't overcome. You can't control. You can't speak about it. Nope. And – I read, I read online someone made this comment. It was another news source, actually. They said they called you Darren Wilson before Darren Wilson happened. And they're referring to Ferguson, Missouri, right. uh, that happened you know, years after your incident. That, and so we know the way social media has built since then. We know the climate that's gone on mm-hmm. now since – I mean, 2010 wasn't pretty. It was just after the Don't, Don't Taze Me Bro incident, which, by the way, our audience needs to know you were the commander of that. We were, hopefully we'll get to that. Um, but if what happened to you happens tomorrow in America, what's the difference? Because uh, it was bad for you in 2010. How much worse would it be in 2016? I think because there's so much uh, instant um, belief that the law enforcement officers are, are taking action that is inappropriate. Right out of the gate, that's the first thing people want to assume. Yeah. I, I think it makes it even worse. I think with video and audio and all those things that are added in now and the ability to to micro criticize everything they do and the art of self preservation, which occurs very quickly because of people's job scared personalities. Which I, I call cowards spineless leaders. Yeah, that's, you call that's them what you term it. Nice, yes. Yeah. And those things are happening so fast. So the quickest thing to do is to take that employee and put them on an island. Yep. And the moment they put them on the island, if they don't maintain connection with that individual and they end up releasing that individual from the job or working out a deal where they'll separate themselves to take off the negative attention from the organization, that individual's future is done. Yeah. Done. And that's what that's that that is the biggest thing. That is the reason that we we in our years of experience now right. push people to transition their careers very quickly from a first responder role to a secondary responder role to try to prevent them from getting that negative attention that quick so you're terminated but you think to yourself i mean you're you know you have a lot of connections a lot of experience i mean you're coordinating university of florida huge events uh a lot of knowledge a lot of tactical background stuff you've done nothing wrong you think to yourself i'm going to be okay i'm going to God has, God has caused this because maybe I'm doing something. I'm going, to, I'm going to do something much better in my life. Tell us that process of looking for th- that other job. You know, it's funny. I, as, a, as a man, you know, we generally control our future. And, and I, I'm, I'm very comfortable in my decision making. I'm very cocky in who I am as an individual. I, I'm probably a little arrogant in, in my personality a lot of times back then. I found that out a little bit today. You have. See how quick yeah. that happens? <laughs> and uh, you, you start realizing, man, I I'm got out angling. I got, so you He is no of, Mark Sherwood. You are much more of a man yeah, than okay. me. Um, you, you realize very quickly that, man, you have value. And then you start looking for jobs, and you realize very quickly that that internet, that yeah. social media, will destroy your opportunity. I'm the, you. I'm the only Stacey Tell in the world, other than my daughter, who's Stacey Tell. And my opportunities were shut down. I would go to interviews, and they would type in my name, and they'd be like, ooh. This thing in Gainesville, we're not really sure we want you representing us. Remember, I ran large events, which is high profile, or I'm a trainer. I'm a trainer, you get in front of classrooms and start talking. Yep. Guess what? People are Googling. Who is this guy? I Googled you the first time I met you. Who's Travis Yates? And I found out who you are. So you're Googling right out of the gate. Right. You, we, we don't want you representing There is a link from England. It's a little child actor that came up. You didn't mistake me for I did not. Okay. I definitely did not. But yeah. I, did, I did realize very quickly that our the negative attention – from our name on the internet is destructive right and our opportunities now become nil uh, it just and, and the, when they wrote the article on me i was at 96 97 rejections i'm now over 100 on career jobs that i tried to get based on one incident and you actually get a really good job 
uh, after this. It was because of your connection with Urban Meyer when he went to Ohio State, who quickly won a national championship and went undefeated one year, actually, when they were on probation, I believe. And will Florida ever win another national championship? Uh, yeah, I don't know if I can answer that, but I can tell you my, my, uh, my views on what happened in Ohio State. Yeah, tell us about Ohio State. You know, I, uh, I, was, I was hired up there, non-law enforcement capacity. I was going to be director of player, or operation manager, whatever. And let me stop everybody. It, it really says something, Stacy, about you and your character and that incident that a man like Urban Meyer would say, come on, because he knew you best. He, you were with him a lot. You were his personal you know, security, your player development guy at Florida. He knew you as a man where the social media trolls don't. Right. And so he put his reputation on the line for you knowing that you were right. And so that says a lot really about this story. And so let me – you can come back with going to, going to work for him. Yeah, so I go up and, and we start rolling the moment the team comes back from the Gator Bowl. And we, I worked there a few months. And next thing I know, they call me and him to an office, to the athletic association – or athletic director's office. And, and uh, immediately there's an attorney in there and she's like, look, the – you know, the president or somebody's being notified and you can't be here. And I'm thinking, why, why can't I be here? And they're like, they, they're they concerned about the relationship you would have being that you're involved in a shooting of a black male working with black athletes. And I'm thinking, 15 years of working with athletes, yeah. Grace never played a card in this at all. Right. But apparently that was an issue. And because of that, the negative attention I was receiving was just, was horrible. And uh, so this, I was, is, this is how long after the incident? Uh, this would have been 2011 into 12, so it would have been a year and five months after I got and hired. And, and, and it was still just in another city, Ohio State. In 2016, it's still there. Wow. Still wow. there. And so you were you, you were let go because of yep. that. Yep. As a matter of fact, I remember the discussion, we need you to separate and all this. This was from the administration, not from the coach himself. And, and uh, I'm like, you know, I didn't do anything wrong. I understand this. And so I was terminated from there and sent back to Florida. And, uh, and that's kind of what led me back into law enforcement from that. That situation. had to be the lowest point. You, you had this job that you thought would turn your life around and, yeah. and give you security. For my family, yep. And, and now you've got, you've got kids in high school. Yep. You've got uh, a wife at home. Uh, yep. And uh, you have no job. You know what it's like trying to find a job. What described that lowest point all because of what you did was your job back in 2010? You know, I came back and I thought to myself, um, you know, what's next? And um, – you know, I've got a lot of faith, and, and my wife, I think, has way more faith than I do, especially at that time. And, and I start thinking, what, what's going to happen? And, and we started realizing that we were in trouble. Uh, we were going to be in trouble financially. We were going to be in trouble providing. And uh, I can remember even applying for a job working in a marina, and then even they were concerned about this negative attention from this thing. And I'm thinking, what am I going to do? Right. And I was running an event for, a, for an athlete, and, and – uh, it was a, a fundraiser and stuff. I was there, and some law enforcement officers from that county that I was in were like, hey, uh, you know, how'd you get this job? And I told them, and they said, you ever thought about working back in law enforcement? I'm like, no, I don't really have a desire to do it. I'm really concerned about, um, uh, you know, what happened to me and don't want to put my family in that position again. They're like, well, if you ever need one, let us know. And, and I had a, a friend there that was real helpful, and a couple months later I had to take a job. And uh, I went back, and, and I'll be honest with you, it's been a – there's been a blessing in disguise in some ways. Mm -hmm. The administration I work for now is really supportive. The environment I work in is much more conservative minded. Um, there, there's, it's a totally different environment that I work in, which has been very positive. And they know what happened to me. They know the negative connotations that come right. from it. And they know the negative attention I've gotten from it. But what is my value even to them? Right. What is my future development from a career standpoint, even to them? Because what, what do you, what opportunities do you get now? Right. And the truth is, Career-wise, you really don't have a lot. So you're there in Florida. You're working as a road deputy. You came from the top of the mountain, and now you lose all that rank, you lose all that seniority, all that you had built in your life with you and your family, and you're on the beat again. Yeah. And uh, tell us that transition and what that has been like for you. It's really humbling. Um, you know, being a – I think the easiest job in law enforcement, I always tell everybody, is a watch commander. Until the moment you have to make a decision, then it becomes yeah. the worst job. But normally, it's one of the one of the smoothest jobs you do in law enforcement. And and now you're back catching calls and you're working for people that are that have no idea. And right. I I, I kind of play a game a lot. I wear a serving since 2015 or 16 pin, so I look brand new on my uniform. And I, and I do that as a game to, to try to play with some people's heads. But truth be known, it, it's kind of humbling and sometimes it's even embarrassing career wise of where you at now. You've been doing police work 23 years and you're a cop on the road. Hmm. 
They have no idea your background. And they don't know. It wasn't because I was doing anything Ill- illegal, immoral, or unethical. Right. Of course. It's because I was making law enforcement decisions. So I meet you a few years after you start that, and you tell me this story, Stacy, and you tell me about the Internet. Go to the, go to the Internet, type in my name, see what you see. There, my life is forever altered because of this, and, of course, I do that. And we make the decision here at lawofficer.com to change that game, to change that mindset. And we had one of our authors, Vicki Newman, contact mm-hmm. you. She is uh, married to... Uh, a high-profile officer out in California. Uh, she's a multiple author. Her website, How to Love Your Cop, I yeah, believe, How to Love Your Cop, is uh, and she's very, very uh, uh, good at what she does. And so we just had a feeling that Vicky could tell your story the right way. And and for, for the first time, almost six years after this incident, your story actually gets told by Vicky. Tell us about that. And what a blessing, you know. Um, Sometimes you never know the purpose behind these things that happen, and and I remember that attorney me telling me that I, I might end up being an advocate, and and I had no idea what that meant, and uh, and we'll talk about that in a little bit about the law enforcement advocacy network, but more importantly is when you when you left that day we had that meeting you said uh, we'll be in touch. Well, I didn't believe you. Why would I believe you? I had been through this many times. You've been rejected over. Oh my times. gosh, yeah. I, had, I had no idea. And, and, and I thought, that's not going to happen. And then when Vicky, you call me, and then Vicky reaches out to me, and, and Vicky wrote a phenomenal article. She, she really did. It took off. Uh, a lot of people that I knew ran with it on the Facebook pages and the Internet, and it just it exploded. And it opened a lot of doors. And I tell people this all the time. You know, when we control our own future, uh, we don't have any control over it. When we think we're running our direction right. and we're making decisions, we don't. Right. We don't. And then sometimes we don't understand the whole purpose. And, and, and you know, I had not crashed a car in 20-something years. And all of a sudden, I back into a tree on a very minor... Uh, Shame on you. Yeah, a minor crash, and I have to go to a driving class, and I sit down in How the class. How was the driving class? The driving class was horrible because the instructor was horrible. <laughs> but, but, uh, but, you know, Travis taught me, you, you're sitting in class, and we build this relationship, and, and look where we're at now. And, and, and what is the purpose? And I've told people this before, whether I was on a call or whether I'm sitting here now or whether down the road I'll be doing other things. I've told people, if I have to go through what I went through in that shooting in, in, in the university, to be sitting in a room with somebody who's in a crisis on a call in my current job at a baseline deputy's level or sitting in front of a camera and telling my story, if I had to go through all of that to change or impact that individual that's out there listening or the person I'm sitting with to change their life, then it's all worth it. It's always worth it if you're able to impact right. that one person's life. And that's kind of the way I looked at it. And that's what I looked at with Vicky's article is if that article was written, if I have to expose myself enough for Vicky to write that article and for that article to take off like it did and it impacts somebody, then it was worth it. You know, it really is incredible and changes dynamics, really, when you do punch in your name on the search engine. We're very wow. fortunate here that it, it comes up to the top. I actually, you don't know what I'm going to do this. I'm going to read a couple comments uh, that came in at the bottom of the article that Vicki Newman wrote. Uh, here's one of uh, here's one of the comments. Uh, I've known Stacy for years. His commitment to service, professionalism, and honesty are unparalleled. I'm a better person for having worked with him. And wow. that was a trend throughout these articles. And for those of you that don't know, uh, writing online, especially the comments you get are not always flattering because you have these kind of keyboard warriors, these, uh, they're cowards, right? They want to sit behind a keyboard and write these vile things. And they never want to talk to you in person. They never want to pick up a phone and call you, but they, they love sitting in their, I like to think they're late at night at their keyboard. <laughs> and they really wanted to be a cop because, but they're a bunch of criminals, so they have to they talk bad about us, right? Whatever it is. And so for these comments to be so positive and a, and a trend of, that, that they are better off knowing you is really impressive. I'm going to read a couple more. We're very proud to know Stacy and Martha. Martha is your wife. And we call them my friends. Very proud to serve with them with the Florida Baptist Disaster Relief. People don't know this, but you, we had an email that came in that said, uh, you don't know him, and I don't know him, but he said, well, how in the world could they do this to Stacy Etel? That guy has helped more orphans and impoverished and disaster relief people than any of these people that have done this to him. You know, how this I mean, his character is unparalleled. And I think the 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 key to understand for our audience is, is if this can happen to Stacy Etel, it can happen to anybody. Yeah, that's it doesn't huge. it doesn't that's matter true. what you've done. That's it true. doesn't matter your experience. It doesn't matter 
anything. That's true. It doesn't matter your character. One moment in time can change it all. Oh, there's no doubt. And, you know, that's what I said about losing my job is there's things I'm involved in now, disaster relief. But I've told people this. If you want to find out who you are, have something very big and negative occur to you, and then watch what people who are hiding behind a computer have an opportunity to say. And what was interesting was with as many people who watched that and saw it in all the Facebook postings, there wasn't an attack on my character. And I have said this and said this and said this. When you stand on your morals and your character, yeah. no matter what else happens, right. that's one thing they can't attack. Right. You make good decisions in your personal life, they can't attack you. I have a feeling, Stacy, that these cowards that did this to you, and you're being polite and nice, and I get myself in trouble for just being truthful. These cowards that did this to you, mm-hmm. they can't sleep well at night. But yeah. even though you went through hell, you sleep good. Yeah, you know, that night I went home and I told my wife, and I remember waking her up at 2 o'clock, and she's like, you're home early the night of the shooting. And I said, yeah. And she said, what happened? And I said, well, you know, um, one of our guys ended up shooting somebody. She's like, what? And she jumps up, and it's this big deal, right? And she's like, well, is everything okay? And I'm like, well, yeah. It went, went the best it could. Yeah. And she's like, no issues? I'm like, no, no issues. And I laid my head down and went to sleep. And you know, every night since then I went to sleep. And I can do that because – my conscience says you make right decisions and yep. you're living a healthy life and you're in that aspect. A lot of the people involved didn't. Right. A lot of them have been, have been affected by divorce and, and a lot of things have gone on because we well know there's always that other person that lays next to us that knows the truth. And that pillow talk is a huge issue. And when you lose respect for when your spouse loses respect for you because you didn't stand up for something that was right, right. they're going to struggle with you. I want to read one more one more comment because this is – really a prevailing thing that we're talking about today and something that we here at lobster.com are just committed to fighting against. Uh, here's a comment on the bottom of your article located at stacyetail.com. We'll send you straight to that article. Uh, this hits way too close to home for me. Where are police leaders of courage? Without the courage to hire this honorable servant warrior, without the courage to stand up to the media and political pundits, thank God for the sheriff with the courage, he's talking about your boss, to help right a wrong. As law enforcement officers, we're supposed to be about doing the right thing. Politics combined with leaders who are anything but destroy good cops on a daily basis. I am praying that God will use this brother in a mighty way. Hmm. Pretty incredible for someone you don't even know that, no that is touched by this, and, and uh, I, I believe he will, Stacy. And he has used you mightily in – a lot of humanitarian efforts. You, uh, you, as we've already mentioned, you just came from Baton Rouge, the flood yeah. victims, and helping them. And yeah. uh, you've been overseas to Haiti, and you've done a bunch of things. Kind of tell our audience kind of uh, what that has done for you, both mentally uh, after this, to be involved in all those humanitarian efforts. You know, having our kids early and then transitioning out of the house a few years ago, and my wife was heavily involved in the Florida Baptist Disaster Relief, and she became kind of a— uh, you know, a lead person in the feeding side, and, and I kind of jumped on board with her and, and followed her around and, and having the opportunity to go to Detroit and do a rebuild on some flooding last year. And she went up to Charleston recently uh, and did some work in that flood. And then her and I were in Baton Rouge, and I flew in from Baton Rouge yesterday. And just watching people of yeah. all levels in life being affected like that and just that little bit of time you spend with them right. and them show them showing that you – them seeing that you care enough to show up right. to help them, right. you know, tear the drywall off their house or scrape mud off their floors yeah. is a huge impact. And then, you know, don't get me wrong, Travis. I, I've been blessed in so many ways. I've lived a law enforcement career that I believe 99% of the cops in this country would love to have an opportunity to do. I've seen some amazing things. I've been with a lot of high-profile persons and gone to some amazing places. I, I've flown to Haiti with some, some really, really uh, amazing people that are affected a lot of people's yeah. lives. And um, it's a blessing. Uh, you, you just wish that this story that, that has been dealt with you can, can impact other people that are in a crisis like this and make them think about there is life on the other end and how do we get there? And, and it's a battle that they're going right. to have. And that's what I think why we created Law Enforcement Advocacy Network. If you're just joining us, you're at Law Officer TV. I'm with Stacy Etel. You can read his story at StacyEtel.com. I'm Travis Chase, Editor-in-Chief of LawOfficer.com. And we just got through talking about uh, Stacy's humanitarian efforts, and it's really something close to our heart here at Law Officer. We are wanting to do things a little differently than the rest, and we want to serve law enforcement. I mean, while we are a business, we want to serve law enforcement, and we want to honor law enforcement. As 
everyone knows in our audience, we have been involved in the International Trainer of the Year Award with Ailita for many, many years. And last year, we, we, we let Ailita kind of take the charge on that. And, and that was the Ed Nowicki Award. Ed Nowicki is, uh, is a wonderful trainer, still, still going strong. And uh, we've had an honor of honoring that. And we want to continue honoring those officers. So we have decided, and Stacy doesn't know this, that we are going to start uh, right now in 2016, the Stacy Etel Humanitarian <laughs> Award. Now you're gonna think wow. that's goofy because I don't want you to get wow. concerned, Stacy, because most awards are named after dead people. Right now, but we have history here. Ed Nowicki is alive and kicking, and actually, Ed Nowicki was the first wow. winner of that award in 2007. Mm-hmm. And uh, we've got the first award here in 2016, the uh, Stacy Etel. Let me get this out. Uh, <laughs> Humanitarian wow. Award oh, goes to it. yeah Stacy Etel. That's kind of weird, right? It's a Stacy Etel Award, but it's it's in recognition of service and dedication and wow. leadership in serving mankind. Wow. And in blessing. law enforcement, that's what we have to be about, does it wow. not? Serving oh, mankind. Doubt. And you and Martha uh, have just been incredible for that. It's an incredible story that, quite frankly, unfortunately, was never told until Vicki Newman wrote it. No doubt. Well, until Travis Yates listened to it, honestly. As many times as you have a chance to tell it and talk to people about yeah. it, you don't realize that, um, you know, and, and that's why my faith is so strong. Sometimes I think that the right people are placed in our lives for a reason. And, and in this case, you know, I went to driving class to meet you, and, and here I am sitting in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, having a conversation with you um, about um, – about some of the things we've been involved in right. in my past. And, you know, uh, my marriage and my wife has put me in positions where I've been able to do these things. And But I want to go back for just a minute. I want to go okay. back to, for every one of us that are watching and what we do in our life, whether we're law enforcement or not, whether we have an opportunity to touch that one person, that's our responsibility. Yep. And and when I go in a home on a call and I sit down with a, a victim of domestic battery and they haul her husband out of the house and she's crying and I put my arm around her and I said, listen, She's like, you don't understand. I said, I don't have to understand, but I can't tell you this. You don't know what I've been through in my past, but if I lost that job in Gainesville to sit in your living room, to put my arm around you, and to spend a little time that will maybe impact you enough for you to change the direction of your life, right. it's worth it. It's right. worth it. And if I went through all those things because maybe, maybe God's going to use me in some other capacity, then it's worth it. And if being on this, this – um, the show here is going to impact somebody that's out there that's struggling, somebody out there that right now is in internal affairs investigation, somebody out there right now that maybe is one of these high-profile people yep. that we don't know that are watching. And if we can create Lean and we can make Lean a, a program that yep. is successful, man, I'll tell you. And you're wanting to get to way. it. You're wanting to get I'm to it. You're excited. Rush, but I think it's a huge deal. Yeah, Law Enforcement Advocacy Network. Uh, you're the executive director of. We right. just announced this today. Yep. Uh, we have that press release that I think we're going to show for you in a minute here on our website. But this is an exciting thing. And and by the way, let me get back to the humanitarian work. We will give that away every year. So we will have something on our website very soon for that, for submissions for 2017. What a really honorable thing to be able to do uh, for our law enforcement officers that are just given so much that really the mass media won't talk about, Stacy. Uh, but when it comes to Lean Law Enforcement Advocacy Network, tell us, we know that was born out of what happened to you, no one having your voice. Wh- what point did you decide that you needed to take this from, man, this stinks for what happened to me, to we've got to help others? Man, I was watching the news, and I was seeing, you know, uh, Mr. Wilson up in Ferguson go through his stuff, and, yep. and the individual recently in Baltimore that went through theirs, and all the other cops that have been through these things. And I started thinking to myself, man, how do we help them? Something has to change. Our hands are tied at our level, and we eat our own as, as law yeah. enforcement personnel. And, and so we sit back and we watch and we say, wait a minute. The officer involved in the incident cannot talk. The employees along that rank structure cannot talk. The chiefs and the sheriffs, some of them can be vocal, but majority of them, hands are tied because they work for commissioners and councils and mayors, and they can't talk, and city managers and county managers, and they can't talk. Yep. And other officers like you who believe in something and want to say something, a lot of times your hands are tied because your agency has procedures in place that doesn't allow you to talk. Somebody has to be able to do it. So when we created this, I started thinking, there's got to be a way to do this. And I thought, I said this, I remember saying this in the, when I was interviewing with Vicky. I said, There's 660,000 cops out there. If every cop put $1 in, there'd be $660,000, and we could show up. 
We could be the voice. We could send people to that location. We could stand next to somebody on stage or in a studio, and we could say, hold on a minute. That's not what happened. You can't attack this individual. This right. individual has a wife and kids and life, and you, they're on an island already, and they're isolated. Yep. You can't do that. And I said, there's a, there's a route for that. And so when we talked about development of lean, that was one of the avenues. The other avenue was what opportunities do they have after it? What opportunity does Mr. Wilson have or do the guys in Baltimore, what's their future or, or Louisiana? What are their futures now? Yeah. And we're talking about police officers that did nothing wrong. That's right. We're not. But support- their job. Yes. And, and so we say, what can they do? Yeah. You can't tell me that individual in Missouri can go out and apply for a job and he's not going to be crucified when he tries to do it. Yeah. There has to be a change. So I said, wait a minute. Let's create an organization that gives them the opportunity, yep. like I had, to tell their story. Let's allow people like Vicki Newman to interview them and write an article. Right. Let's allow Lawstra.com to post it. Let's, let's allow uh, 10 Forward Ministries to support it. Let's get these people involved, and let's push this story, and let's let them have their platform. And then let's do something else. Let's take a group of them, and let's go to sh- chiefs and sheriff's conferences, and let's be invited in, and let us speak in front of those leaders so that those leaders can see how to handle people differently within their organization. So they'll be thinking, uh-oh, we just had a shooting. Okay, we've got a lot of heat on this, but hold on a minute. i got this guy over here I need to make sure I'm taking care of. So when the self-preservation of. things pop up. they got to think of an po- opportunity, an they option can, They different. have another option. Yeah, absolutely. Self-preservation's here. Coward's here. Pretty close together. Yeah, pretty close together. Just one little line in the middle. We just need leaders to be leaders. Yeah. That's all we need. We just need people to do the right thing. Right. That's that's all we need. Yep. And and you know what? Doing the right thing is not hard. You're right. Sometimes the repercussions are harsh, but you still did the right thing. That's what what this profession is founded on. And here's the other thing I want to say. What if we didn't do the right thing exactly? What if we made policy failures? What if we made mistakes? What we have done in the society is we've taken away the human element. We have shut down the ability to make mistakes. Yep. And when you take away the human element, you've basically said that we're perfect. Yep. And human beings aren't perfect. Well, and I've often said that there's no grace for this for, for these officers because there's a difference between a mistake and a criminal act. That's correct. Every profession makes mistakes. That's, That's why correct. doctors have malpractice insurance. Every profession That's makes correct. a mistake. That's correct. And people understand that except – in law enforcement. That is correct. And, and when, so even when mistakes are made, we don't stand up and go, you know what? Our employee made a mistake. Yep. And unfortunately, it affected the, 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 another individual, and we're going to deal with that. Right. And, and we're going to focus on that. We're going to assist that individual. We're going to retrain. We're going to go through these things. But that's not what we do. We put them on an island. Yep. We don't let anybody talk to them. We don't ever let them tell their story. Then they're ridiculed in the media, and they never have an opportunity to move forward. And then it's over forward. with. And we, we see a prime example here with Stacy. Uh, we've seen the examples across the country, and we're just talking about the high-profile people. There are countless, countless police officers that have suffered in silence, and Lean is about not letting that happen again. And I can tell you, when we told Stacy's story, which is one of the things Lean will do, is tell these stories that no one will tell. When we told your story, some things started happening for you, did they not? Absolutely. Uh, you know, the, the phone calls that started coming in from people who would contact lawofficer.com and say, how do I get a hold of them, the emails – um, you know, there's a company out of Texas that's talking to me about doing some stuff for them. There's organizations now that are reaching out. I, I recently went to Missouri to fight a case for some lieutenants that were going to be placed on, on an at-will position, and we won that battle. Yeah. Uh, matter, matter of fact, we found out last night that we won that battle. Because of a coward chief. Yeah, because of I think the, I've said that a few times. Yeah, today. you have, from a chief that wanted to have the ability to place their thumb in control. Right. And, and I think that's a huge issue here. Um, and so those opportunities are opening up. And, and these conversations, I think, will stir it up enough yep. that people say, wait a minute, we need to do something different. We need to change the way we handle these employees, and we need to affect them. Because guess what? Today, tonight, it's a Friday night in this country. We know it's going to happen again. Yep. Unfortunately, some type of deadly force situation is going to occur, and is it the next one? Is it the next one that that person has hung out there? And we don't want that to happen anymore. If you're just joining us, you're watching Law Officer TV with Stacey Tell. You can find his story at StaceyTell.com. We have a few more minutes left. We haven't gotten to any questions because this has been just fascinating stuff, Stacey. Thank you, even though I'm out angling you a little you bit. You got me, thing. big I man. Got you. But uh, if you have any questions, get them in quickly. Uh, we'll try to get to some of them here in a minute. I have one more question for you, Stacey. There is no doubt officers watching this right now. And they're going through something very similar. Maybe it's on a smaller scale than you, but they're going through something very similar. You made it through the darkness into the light. You're on your feet. 
you're succeeding in life, you're thriving in life, you are, you're living with this as a mark, but you are succeeding and you're moving forward, you're putting one foot in front of the other. What do you have to say to them? Well, there's a lot of different avenues, and I tell people this. Um, you know, if you got faith, you need to stand on your faith. And, and if you got if you got support personnel around you, like your spouse, man, I'm going to tell you, if you're not listening to the intuition of your wife, you're not, you're not on the same page because I, I had to learn the hard way of doing that. Uh, but I also tell you this. Uh, what happened to you in this situation that you might be in is that you had a card dealt to you. And I try to tell everybody this. Every one of us have many cards that have been dealt to us in our life. My question is, is what do you do with that card? Do you sit on that, that, that deck of cards in your back pocket and not show anybody? I could do that. Travis, you could do that. Yeah. Or do you pull that deck of cards out and you lay them on a table and you say, here I am. I told everybody on this show about myself, didn't I? I told them about my past, my, kid, my parents' background, the fact that I have kids, the shooting thing, my own arrogance, my own ego. I tell you everything. Those are my cards. And I laid them out. Lay your cards out. Play your cards. Show those cards and impact somebody else. Even in your darkest hour, you still can affect other people. And that's the reason we got into this job. Yeah. And even in our darkest hour, we can still affect somebody else. I don't want to leave your wonderful wife out. Martha uh, was by your side during all of this. Uh, we have an article on our website. Just type in Martha Etel, and you'll see that article. Surviving by Faith. Surviving by Faith. It's an incredible, incredible piece on something that really has not been done, talking about the the spouse is rolling this because this is much harder on someone's spouse really than the person going through it. Tell us about what her support meant to you. Well, you know, uh, my wife's a strong um, Christian lady who, who I think from the beginning, even before this happened, she knew there was a lot of negative things going on. Um, she saw, you know, my cockiness and my arrogance on a lot of things. And she was just, uh, she was pretty vocal about it. And, um, you know, without her support, I'm not who I am as a person. Right. Without her development as me, I can remember being young at, at 20 years old, 21 years old, being married to her and riding down the road and looking at the, the homeless guy on the street corner and going, that homeless guy needs to get a job. But then I realized, you know, maybe there needs to be some compassion about some things that go on in this world. Yeah. And I didn't know it. And she was always the one trying to teach me. She was always the one trying to help me and guide me. And, and uh, I'm not where I'm at today without her support and her guidance. Right. Unbelievable. Picture of her that just popped uh, up. Stacy, the Stacy Etel Humanitarian Award. <laughs> Uh, no man, idea. We, we are that was so, this is going to be so awesome for us to give away each year, and, and hopefully we can bring each award winner to our studio uh, each year to give them this award. I can't think of a better person to name it after, Stacy, uh, my friend. You're a good man. Thank you for all you've done for law enforcement. Thank wow. you for all you've done for lawofficer.com and our audience, and wow. uh, we just can't thank you enough. Wow. Well, thank you, Travis Jason. I, I can't thank lawofficer.com. I can't thank... 4-H Ministries, um, you know, just uh, Vicki Newman, just the personnel that were involved in all this stuff has been such an impact. And, you know, folks, I, I just challenge you to, to be supportive of it and uh, recognize that every one of you out there might need some, some assistance from Lean at some point. Stacey Attell, you've been watching Law Officer TV. Thank you for joining us tonight. Take care. Thank you.